Good morning, everyone. Privyat. And uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, crash and Byzantine fault tolerance, and then something in between in the next in the second part of the lecture, which is um, so. So the the two parts of the lectures are, are going to be very different. The first is um, more of um, classical materials, so the the. the, the very foundational distinctions between uh, fault models, the traditional fault models of crash and Byzantine fault tolerance. And the second part of the lecture is going to be more of a research talk. It's actually a work that is still in progress. Um, and it's uh, how these fault models can be applied to solve a practical problem related to a very recent technology called TEEs. These are trusted execution environments. And I'll talk about this a little bit in the uh, in more detail in the second part of the talk. So uh, let's start with the first part then. Uh, and the uh, the motivation is, uh, this is actually very similar to the first slide of uh, Edith's talk uh, uh, yesterday, where uh, I'm essentially uh, uh, motivating the need, the importance of, of uh, handling faults. Uh, and uh, I'll motivate this with some uh, realistic numbers. Uh, suppose you have a data center with uh, a few tens of thousands of machines, which is not a very, not a particularly large data center for uh, the scale of uh, large internet companies. So if you have 70, 75,000 machines, uh, four disks per machine, and then you take the numbers from a recent uh, measurement study, and uh, in, in, on average, they 3% uh, of the disks in a data center require a replacement in a given year. So this is a real number taken, taken from a measurement study, I believe, at Google. Uh, so given these numbers, uh, how often do you guys think that uh, uh, these disks will suffer a permanent fault that will require uh, a replacement? Once a uh, week, a day, an hour, or a minute? Just, um, um, I'll give you a few seconds to try to guess uh, what the right answer is. Um, so you, you, you won't well, post your answers. <laughs> okay. Yep. <laughs> So this is the uh, back of the envelope uh, calculation that uh, that uh, that gives the the, the, the answer. So um, the the data center has around three hundred thousand disks, and um, if you multiply this by three percent, it means that on average nine thousand of them are going to fail uh, permanently, requiring a replacement in, in a given year. Well, uh, one year also has around nine thousand hours, a few a few less than that, and uh, and so uh, we have about one uh, once per hour you're going to have to replace a disk in this data center. So faults uh, at this scale are the norm and not the exception. That's that's the main uh, message. And and of course, this were I was just talking about one instance of faults, which are permanent disk faults. But you have uh, uh, several others. I, I believe that Edith started with, uh, her talk with uh, motivating with network faults. So this is just one possible class of, of faults. Um, and so given this uh, importance, uh, it's uh, no surprise that uh, people have worked on this for a long time. I think the earliest reference we can uh, um, find of a replication protocol is coming from uh, Augsburg and Day. This was in uh, 1976, and as you can see, uh, the, the, this was probably written in a typewriter, or, uh, or, um, and and uh, it was published in a software engineering conference, which is still the top software engineering conference today. It's called ICSI, and this is a a very simple replication protocol um, with uh, essentially one primary server that uh, receives an operation and then propagates it to a set of uh, backup machines. Okay. Now, um, when, when we look at these protocols, um, the, their design really uh, depends heavily on the set of assumptions that, that these protocols make. And, uh, and there are different classes of assumptions that, that they are making that are going to influence their design. For instance, um, there are assumptions regarding the behavior of faulty nodes. So what you saw, for instance, in uh, yesterday's lecture by Edith was that uh, the, there was an assumption that a faulty node would uh, stop uh, executing the protocol altogether. So it would just fail silently and just stop stop working, halt, essentially. Um, but what we're going to see in today's lecture is a different kind of fa failure behavior where uh, instead of just silently failing, the nodes can actually start um, 
issuing wrong outputs, say that your uh, software has a bug, uh, well, then your program might actually return a buggy output. Um, the other uh, set of assumptions that uh, these protocols uh, have to make uh, is regarding the timing behavior. For instance, this uh, Alsberg and Day uh, protocol uh, assumed that there was an upper bound on the time to transmit and process a message uh, between uh, to any uh, any two nodes. And this is nice to have this assumption of an of such an upper bound because it means that faults are detectable. This means that uh, in this Alsberg and Day protocol, um, if a node didn't reply to a ping, this would guarantee that the node was actually crashed, and so you could replace it with another backup node, for instance. Um, now, in practice, this assumption is very often not met, particularly in an open internet environment where um, nodes uh, uh, may be separated by wide area links, or they may, sub they may be subject to uh, um, um, problems or even attacks on the network that will slow down uh, their um, network messages. And so you cannot really uh, ensure that there's going to be such an upper bound. Um, and this makes the protocol design much more difficult, of course, because you can't really distinguish a slow from a faulty participant. Okay, so uh, the, the uh, today's lecture is really going to focus in terms of timing behavior on the second option, basically uh, that there is no upper bound on the message transmission time. So this is called the asynchronous model. As I said, it's more realistic, but also more challenging in terms of the design of the protocols. And in terms of the failure behavior, I'm going to uh, focus on both, but a lot more on the Byzantine failure. Sorry, on the on the on the second failure behavior, where the nodes um, are going to fail, not just by silently crashing, but also by issuing wrong answers. And this is um, 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 really what's going to distinguish uh, today's lecture from yesterday's. So it, I'm going to build upon what was taught yesterday by Edith, and I'm going to extend it to this um, different kind of failure behavior. Okay. So yesterday, what you guys saw was really uh, a crash model. Uh, uh, in crash fault tolerance, nodes just silently halt uh, when they fail. And this is um, nice because it matches actually a lot of the faulty behavior. Um, it's used by a lot of uh, systems that are running in today's data centers. So if you look at the systems that are published by Google or Facebook or uh, other internet companies, they actually uh, employ this model. And sometimes they argue that they employ this model, not exactly because all faults are crash faults, but because they can have they have ways in which they turn their non-crash faults into crash faults. They say that you can, uh, for instance, very thoroughly try to catch exceptions uh, in your code and then always make sure that the, the process crashes when such an exception is, is caught. So this is actually very widely used. And so uh, um, like, I, like I show in this picture, this is a timing diagram. So time goes from left to right. And in this timing diagram, uh, you have a client machine to call, uh, sending a message of type ping to the server machine. Then the server replies with a message of type pong. And then halfway through the execution, the server crashes. This means that it's going to silently stop executing protocol steps. And in this uh, case, when the client sends other messages of type ping, these are not going to have a reply because the server is no longer execution, executing its, uh, its logic. So this is um, the, your typical timing diagram uh, that I'm going to show a few of them today and uh, applied to the crash model where uh, the server is crashing. Okay, so, um, now, in, in terms of designing protocols for a given model, uh, either the crash or the Byzantine model, there is this very important distinction that you need to um, uh, really uh, absorb, which is uh, the distinction between the specification and the implementation of the protocol. So the specification says, what is the protocol supposed to do? Um, it really defines the correctness of the protocol. The protocol is correct if it behaves, if the system behaves in a certain way. Okay. Whereas the implementation is the logic of the protocol that enforces, that implements the 
uh, specifications. So it's really the set of messages that are exchanged and the behavior of the different nodes or processes in the in the system that uh, implements that specification. Okay, so and on this first part of the, of the talk, uh, I'm going to focus on a storage system with a read-write operation, just like yesterday's uh, uh, first part of uh, Edith's talk. Uh, and, and, and the important thing is that uh, while I'm also only focusing on a single object, if you have an, a storage system with large number of data items, you can actually run multiple instances of, of the protocols that I will describe. And so this, uh, what I'm going to describe, even though it's only for a single object, it actually generalizes to, to multiple objects. And so the first question I'll, I'm going to uh, pose is, uh, you know, what are the possible specifications that we can have that are interesting uh, for a system with multiple clients and uh, with the, with this kind of interface that only supports read and write operations for a single object? And the answer to this question was actually given in a paper uh, by Leslie Lamport. And uh, I'm actually posting here a snapshot of the uh, front page of the paper. I think the most interesting part of this is that he seems to have written this paper on Christmas Day in 1985. Um, it appeared initially as a, a, a research report. And uh, if you go to Leslie Lamport's uh, page, there's always a little uh, explanation or a little story around these papers. And uh, you can see what the, what the story about this one. I, I believe it was something along the lines of he, he, he had this as a research report. Um, but then uh, uh, he started seeing that other people were uh, proposing similar ideas, and so he finally uh, wrote this up and, and made it uh, public. Um, so what does he say? He's actually proposing three types of semantics. I know that uh, yesterday's lecture, you only covered two. The third one is going to be very important today because of the uh, Byzantine fault model, which uh, uh, introduces new types of behaviors. So the ones that you saw um, um, uh, uh, yesterday were regular and atomic semantics. I'm going to introduce a third um, uh, type of semantics called safe semantics. Um, now, um, in safe semantics, what happens is the following. If you have a read operation that is not concurrent with any write, then this read can re must return the most recently written value. But if you have a read operation that is concurrent with a write, then nothing is required. Basically, all bets are off and you can return anything. Okay. Um, so these are the safe semantics. The, uh, r the other two, which you saw before, were regular semantics, where uh, uh, similarly, the reads that are not concurrent with any writes must return their most recently written value, but reads that are concurrent with writes must return one of two options, either the old or the new value. Okay. And finally, with atomic semantics, which uh, also applies to multiple writers, this basically means that there's a total order of all operations, and the, uh, the reads must return the most recently written value according to that total, total order. And also, this total order has an important requirement that it has to be consistent with the real-time order in which the operations were invoked. So this means that uh, if, you, if you think of a timeline of the execution of the system, there is always a serialization port point of each operation, sometime, some point between the invocation and the re reply of the operation. And it's as if operations were executed instantaneously, atomically, at each serialization port. Okay. Um, and by the way, um, just as a final note here, uh, this the, 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 the semantics that Lamport defines are really for a single writer. You cannot have multiple processes writing uh, in, for to this object. Um, the, the the specification, though, it generalizes quite straightforwardly to multiple writers. Basically, it generalizes by saying that uh, uh, when you define most recent in the in the in the in the in the, in the three definitions above, they always use the the word uh, most recent. Uh, the the definition of of most recent is based on the existence of a total order of rights. So this total order must exist and it must be consistent with the real time order. So you cannot have two rights that one. Uh, concludes before the 
other one starts and they are reversed in terms of the order of their effects. So just with this simple um, change or um, clarification of the meaning of most recent in the above definitions, you gain a, a complete uh, definition of uh, safe, regular, and atomic semantics for read-write objects with multiple writers and multiple readers. <laughs> Okay, so these are the specifications. Now let's go through a few examples. I think these will help clarify uh, uh, the the meaning of these uh, these semantics. So again, we have a timeline. Uh, time goes from left to right. We have two clients. One of them is writing two different values, value seven and value twelve, and client two is uh, reading those has issues two read operations. Suppose that the first read operation returns twelve, the second read operation returns seven. Uh, is this does this um, execution obey uh, safe, regular, and atomic semantics? Well. I would say that safe, yes, it seems that it's definitely um, uh, safe semantics because uh, in safe semantics, if you have a read that is concurrent with the write, it can return anything. So yeah, looks like it's fine. Uh, regular semantics, yeah, I think it's fine because uh, in regular semantics, if you have a read that is concurrent with the write, it can return either the old value of seven or the new value of 12. So that's totally fine. Atomic, I have some questions about atomic because uh, for atomic semantics, you cannot return 12 and then go back to the value seven because it would be impossible to find a serialization point where um, essentially, if I, if this guy here returns 12, I have some serialization point here. This would imply that the serialization point for writes, for this write of 12, has to be somewhere before uh, this guy here. But if this serialization point is before this guy here, um, uh, meaning that if the write serialization point happens before the read serialization point, uh, then the serialization of the second read, which happens after the serialization of the first read, is also after the serialization of the right. And so this implies that it would have to return seven, it couldn't, uh, 12, it could not return seven. So read prime, the second read could not return seven. So this is not atomic. Okay, okay. so. Uh, now let's change the example a little bit then. Uh, let's say that a read uh, returns seven and a read prime also returns seven. Is this safe, regular, and atomic? It is completely safe. Safe means that uh, both reads can return anything. That's fine. Um, it is also regular. In regular semantics, reads can return either the old value of seven or the new value of 12. So that's also fine. Atomic, is this atomic? Well, it turns out that this is also atomic, okay? Why? Because there exists a serialization um, that is uh, consistent with the real-time order and um, that explains this execution. What do I mean by this? I mean that I can insert a serialization point for the first write somewhere here, okay? And then for the first read somewhere here, and then for read prime, I have to serialize it right in the beginning. Okay, I cannot serialize it uh, at some later point in the execution over here. This wouldn't work. And this works as long as the serialization point of the second write, write of 12, happens some point here. Okay. Uh, and so if you take this... Uh, total order that is given by this serialization point where this is the first point in the total order, this is the second point in the total order, this is the third and this is the fourth, then uh, it so happens that the output of reads according to this total order matches the output that I obtained in the execution of the program. So read uh, returns seven, read prime also returns seven because write of 12 happens afterwards, okay? So this is fine, okay? 
And finally, we have this weird execution that doesn't uh, that is different from what you guys saw yesterday, where let's say that read returns 12 and read prime returns smiley face. It turns out that according to the definition that Leslie Lampard gave of safe semantics, this is safe. Um, why is it safe? Because in safe semantics, a read that is concurrent with writes, such as these two reads, may return anything. Like I said, all bets are off. And so it's fine for this guy to return smiley face, okay? Because uh, it is uh, concurrent with the write. So this is fine. Uh, regular, no, it's not regular because uh, when a read is concurrent with a write, it can return either the old or the new value. Smiley face is not either the old or the new value, and so that doesn't work. And of course, it's not atomic because smiley face, again, again doesn't correspond to a serial execution of the system according to uh, any serialization order. Okay. All right, so, um, and then just, so that was it about specification. Now I'm going to move to the implementation, meaning the protocols that uh, enforce this specification. And in yesterday's lecture, we saw this protocol called ABD, okay, which I'm not going to uh, waste too much time on because you already saw this. And in ABD, um, there is, it's essentially a two-phase protocol. Both reads and writes have two phases um, where, um, um, and, and this protocol uh, works in the crash fault tolerance setting. So it assumes crash faults, uh, assumes also an asynchronous system. So there are no bounds on message delays. And this uh, protocol, it, uh, um, um, it works uh, within two phases for both reads and write operations. So in, in a write operation, uh, say that client one wants to write value 12, uh, client one starts by asking what is the current timestamp and it obtains the current timestamp from a, a majority of nodes. In this case, maybe they return, well, the current timestamp is one. And so it writes the value 12 in the second phase, associating it with, um, timestamp two, so it increments the timestamp and then propagates it to another majority, okay? But sometimes, because this is an asynchronous system, sometimes these messages can actually take a long time, they can take a wrong turn somewhere in the internet, and so they will actually, it might take a while for it to get delivered. So now let's see what happens within the read protocol, say that client two wants to read this value. Um, it issues a read, tries to contact the quorum, but again, this message, maybe it got lost here. So the second message, this one got lost. It never reaches replica one. So what's gonna happen in this case? Okay, what is this uh, read operation going to return? Well, replica three is talking to itself and it's contacting replica two. Uh, so in this case, <coughs> Um, sorry, I think I have a small bug in this execution. Sorry, this is this is a bug in my slide. Sorry. Um, let me just quickly fix this. Quickly fix. That's okay. Uh, so so this uh, guy is going to uh, propagate value seven with time step one and return value seven. Okay. Sorry about this. Um, why is this the case? Because this message took a long time to be delivered. This message also took a long, sorry, this one and this one both took a long time to be delivered. And so uh, the quorum that the replica three gathers here uh, has uh, in both cases uh, time step one and value seven. And so this is the value that is propagated to all the replicas in the second phase of the protocol. And this operation returns seven. And uh, finally, it's only here that uh, this replica is going to receive uh, value 12. And so this write operation only concludes around here. And this is legal because the return of this, um, this, this read operation is actually concurrent with this long write operation. And so you can have a serialization point where the read is serialized here and the write is serialized here. Okay, so this is why this is atomic. Okay, okay now the important thing about uh, 
crash fault tolerance and uh, uh, and the ABD protocol that you saw yesterday is the uh, quorum intersection. And so in this uh, quorum intersection, this means that once I conclude an operation, once the write operation finishes, I am certain that this write operation is going to be visible to all the other replicas to all the other clients essentially and so why is this the case because majorities have this nice property that any two majorities uh, intersect and so in crash fault tolerance a majority is called a quorum uh, quorums in general are uh, subsets of a given set with given intersection properties in this case of crash fault tolerance intersection properties means that any two quorums intersect in at least one replica so have one common replica and why is this important because if i write a value to us to a couple of replicas in this case in a case of having three replicas then i can read another value in any other two replicas and i am sure that at least one of them this guy here is going to have the most recent value, which is associated in this case with the highest timestamp of two. And so in this read quorum, I can distinguish between these two values, 12 and seven, I can distinguish that 12 is the most recent one because it is associated with the highest timestamp. So this is the main um, uh, property that uh, was uh, involved in the correct uh, in the correctness of the ABD protocol. Okay. okay, so that was it about revisions from yesterday's lecture. Uh, uh, and now uh, we are advancing to a new uh, system model, a new fault model called Byzantine fault tolerance. This, uh, this model was uh, uh, introduced again by Lamport but also Shostak and Pease. Um, and the, uh, the interesting thing about this model is that there was, uh, um, again, if you go to Leslie Lamport's uh, page, you, you have a little story about how this uh, paper uh, appeared. And uh, it turns out that initially he had proposed this as uh, he had formulated this as the Albanian general's problem. Uh, and then he claims in that uh, story that uh, he thought, oh, Albania is just a very uh, isolated country. So no one is going to uh, worry about the fact that in this um, in this uh, um, in, in this story that he tells in this paper, uh, some of the generals are are loyal, but the Albanian generals were traitors, and so. Uh, some colleague of uh, Leslie Lamport called the attention that maybe the Albanian readers uh, uh, would be um, <clears throat> would not would, would be a little bit unhappy that uh, their their uh, their generals would be called uh, traitors, and so he changed the name of the of the fault model uh, from Albanian to Byzantine. So this is because the Byzantine. Um, um uh civilization or empire is no longer existent okay so um in this byzantine fault model what 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 is uh what happens uh, basically uh the idea is that when a node is faulty you make absolutely no assumptions about the behavior of the, that node so it, the, the node can deviate arbitrarily from the algorithm it can um, um, produce wrong answers it can produce no answers it can uh, replay old answers it can uh, replay messages that it saw coming by in the network it can try to pose as other nodes intentionally and uh, arbitrarily deviate from the from the protocol um, why is this relevant in practice? Well, uh, the idea here is that, first of all, it can um, be used because of uh, unintentional faults like software bugs. Uh, so if you have a software bug, you can have a uh, process that will answer a, a, a wrong reply. But it can also be used in security second things. So if you have a, a, a replicated system and a few of the replicas are attacked or are some somehow under an attacker's control, then these uh, are going to also uh, be modeled with the Byzantine model because uh, they might arbitrarily deviate from the correct protocol because they will be running the code of the attacker. And so this can also be used as a security uh, um, measure, okay? Of course, um, this doesn't work if all of the replicas are, are arbitrarily, uh, are behaving arbitrarily. And so you always uh, need to assume that there's a maximum number of Byzantine faults and this maximum is uh, expressed as uh, a, fa a failure threshold, F. Uh, and, um, 
and, and these protocols are typically more expensive uh, th than the crash fault tolerant uh, protocols. Not only they require more replicas, but also they require the use of cryptographic primitives. And in terms of these cryptographic primitives, there are also two uh, important classes of cryptographic primitives that these protocols used with different properties and also with a different cost in terms of their the time that it takes to execute them. So one of them is digital signatures. In digital signatures, uh, the idea is that every participant of the protocol has uh, access to a public and private key pair. The private key is kept uh, private, so no one knows, only the, the, the process itself knows about this private key, but then the public keys are known by everyone. And so with this, I can um, issue a simple digital signature. I can take a message M and I sign it by uh, computing a hash of this message and then encrypting the hash with the private key. And any, anyone can verify this message by decrypting it, uh, this signature, sorry, by decrypting it with, with the public key um, uh, and then uh, comparing the hash of the message that was received with the the the, the decryption uh, uh, of the signature, and if they match, then the the, the the signature was valid. If they don't match, that the signature was not valid. Um, so this is very good because anyone that has access to the public key and in principle public keys are known to the entire system. And so anyone uh, who knows uh, the public key of the sender of the message can verify that the message was indeed generated by that sender. Okay. So digital signatures are very strong. They have this very nice property that I mentioned, but they are also expensive. It takes uh, uh, a fair amount of time to compute and to verify a digital signature because of this encryption step. And so um, an alternative that is much cheaper but less powerful is a uh, MAC or message authentication code where uh, this is more of, of a point-to-point -point, uh, authentication. You have two nodes, I and J, or two processes, that are, um, they, and, and, they, uh, and before communicating, they, they, they established a common secret, uh, which I call K here. Um, establishing a common secret is actually quite simple. It's, there's several protocols, like uh, Diffie-Hellman, for instance, for, for, for doing this. Um, and so um, with this, when I, when I have a message, I can create an authenticator. Uh, and you can see this authenticator essentially as a, a, a hash of the message concatenated with the K, uh, with, with a secret K. This is actually this simple uh, uh, construction here. This is actually a, vulnerable to, to a, an attack called length, length extension. And so they, in practice, use, the, use a slightly more complex uh, construction. But conceptually it's it's very similar and so the idea is the following uh, if I receive a message and I receive uh, this authenticator here uh, how do I know that the message came from the right guy well I can uh, com because the receiver also has access to key K then it can compute the same authenticator compare the value with the value of the authenticator that came here and because I and J are the only two guys in the world that know K then I know that this message actually came from the right guy. Okay. So this is nice because uh, Macs uh, are very efficient. All they require really is computing a hash and a couple of uh, exclusive OR operations. This is very efficient, efficient unlike uh, this thing here uh, in digital signatures, which involves public key cryptography, which is much more expensive. But uh, unfortunately, Macs are less powerful than digital signatures because they are uh, digital signatures are transferable. Uh, this means that they offer a non-repudiation property. What is this non-repudiation property? This means that um, if I have a message and it's digital signature, I can show the message and the digital signature to a third party. Maybe I can show it to a judge and, the, and convince the judge that um, the person actually sent the message. So, why is this the case? Because the judge also knows the public key of the sender, and so it can compute the validity of the signature and say, yes, I believe uh, that uh, the guy sent the message, so the guy cannot repudiate the fact that he sent the message. 
with max this is not the case but because max are based on a secret k that is only known by the two guys involved by i and j so if i take a message and it's authenticator it's mac and i take it to a judge the judge will have no idea whether it's valid or not because the judge doesn't know what is the secret k that was shared uh between the the, the two two persons involved okay okay so this is the the two very important uh cryptographic primitives that will be uh, used as building blocks of these protocols and in particular with these two primitives, what we're going to do in the protocol description is that uh, in the Byzantine model, we will assume that the channels are always going to use max um, between the, the, these are point to point channels. So between every two processes, we always authenticate messages with max. This is very cheap, very uh, computationally efficient. And this gives us the, uh, the nice property that if a process uh, J receives a message from process I, it can be certain that the message actually came from I. Okay, so this um, appending the max and uh, uh, verifying the max, it's, it's not going to appear in the protocol descriptions because it's going to be implicit. Uh, in contrast, the digital signatures are more expensive and so we will have them appearing explicitly in the, in the, in the protocol description whenever they are necessary. Okay. Okay, so now let's move on to implementing protocols in the Byzantine world, okay? Um, so the first observation is uh, what the quorum systems that you learned uh, in uh, Edith's lecture with uh, ABD, well, they turn out to, uh, no longer to work. Uh, why is that the case? Well, because now if you have uh, this property that uh, quorums, uh, which are essentially majorities, intersect at a single uh, replica. This uh, single replica where they intersect, it may be Byzantine faulty. And if it's Byzantine faulty, it's going to lie. And so it can return any value that it wants. Okay, It can return a value uh, 200 associated with timestamp 5. And so it will convince the reader that the right that the the the, the current uh, uh, object uh, it has value two hundred associated with it. Okay. So majorities are no I longer working. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah, there is a quick question from Eugen. Um, it's about uh, Max and, and signatures. So if, if mm -hmm. a faulty node shares a Mac with other faulty node, who can Correct. who can we tell from which node came the message? <laughs> That's a good point. Um, so, so um, the max, the, this nice property of authentication, it, it's really only valid if the two processes are correct and are obeying the protocol. Now, if if one process is incorrect, if it's faulty, it can share the secret with another faulty node, and then you really don't know who is. Um, uh, sending that message, but what you, if you think about this, it doesn't really matter much because if the guy is faulty, it can behave arbitrarily anyways. So it's almost as uh, I guess what I'm arguing is if if, if you have a Byzantine faulty node, um, uh, it's it's indifferent. I, I I don't care if the guy is forging a message or if he's asking someone to forge a message on his behalf. I mean, he could he could have this colluding node, and uh, the colluding node can be either uh, communicating directly with uh, with me, or it can be uh, whispering things on the, the faulty node's ear and then communicating with me. So in practice. Um, uh, the the question is correct. So if a faulty node uh, shares the secret with someone else, then the property of Max is no longer valid. But I'm also arguing that in terms of the protocol design, this doesn't matter because the faulty node is already able to behave arbitrarily anyways. So uh, sh having someone else impersonating him is just an instance of this arbitrary behavior. So it, it doesn't affect the protocol design session. But that was a, a very good question. I hope that I... Yeah, but so good notes still think that... Uh, ah, yeah. If, I, I'm reading the follow-up. If good notes still okay, think that the message came from only one... Uh, no, let me think about... Uh, well, essentially, uh, 
that's true, right? I mean, if 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 a Mac, uh, if if the faulty node is sharing uh, the uh, let me let me think about this. If the faulty node is sharing the secret with another uh, colluding faulty node. Uh, then the good node is going to be thinking that it's talking to a single node that is correct when in fact it's talking to two nodes. But in terms of the um, abstraction of the execution of the system, it's the same. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's talking to one or two nodes um, because um, um, essentially um, the, the, the node that it thinks it's talking to is already Byzantine, so it doesn't really matter whether the message is coming physically from one process or from two processes. The effects on the protocol are the same, which is that um, that the faulty node that shared the secret is Byzantine faulty. So, uh, so, so, I mean, the faulty node F1 shares Mac with F2 and F2 sends message. We still going. Yes, yes, this is true, sir, right? So, um, if a faulty node F1 shares a Mac with F2, okay, both are Byzantine faulty, and then F2 sends a message, we believe we are tricked that we are uh, to thinking that we are talking to F1. This is correct. Um, my point is only that um, this is not going to affect the correctness of the protocols that we will design here because F1 was Byzantine faulty, so it can behave arbitrarily. And this arbitrary behavior includes uh, having someone else impersonating him and, uh, and doing whatever it wants, okay? So this is all correct. The questions are very good because they are capturing behaviors that are possible under under the use of, of Max. But um, I'm also arguing that uh, this is not uh, going to affect the correctness of the protocols because the Byzantine model is so general because it assumes arbitrary behavior. Okay. okay, you're welcome. All right, so um, let's see. Now we have this this new model, the Byzantine model, and we have um, these nice primitives. And like I said, previous quorums no longer work, so we need to adapt the quorums. Okay, we need to change new uh, to a new uh, class of quorums. And in the paper that I gave you, the paper by uh, Dadia Maki and Mike Reiter. Um, <laughs> They devise uh, a couple of different um, constructions for Byzantine quorum systems. And uh, let's start with the dissemination uh, Byzantine quorum systems. Uh, and in this, uh, um, this construction, what they say is, okay, we, we have, um, uh, we, we need to have the property that any two quorums contain, uh, the intersection between any two quorums contain at least one non-faulty replica. Okay. So in the intersection between any two quorums, there's always got to be one good guy who is going to be uh, ensuring uh, the truth of, of, of the reply. Okay. Um, so how is this achieved? No, this is just, you just, just do the math. It's quite simple. So say that uh, you ha we have n nodes and the quorum size is q. Uh, we can uh, compute the size of the intersection. The size of the intersection is this equation here, uh, n minus n minus q minus n minus q. So it's basically the size of the intersection is uh, the total number of nodes minus uh, the number of nodes that were excluded from the first quorum minus the number of nodes that were excluded from the second quorum. And this gives you the size of the intersection. And so, like I said, the way that uh, Malky and Reiter define Byzantine quorum systems or dissemination Byzantine quorum systems was that the intersection must contain at least one non-faulty replica. So this number that I just computed here, it has, has to be greater than S to make sure that it contains one non-faulty replica. Okay, and so this gives you uh, this uh, one equation for the for the, uh, the the size of the quorums, and then we have a second equation, um, which is that we also must ensure that quorums are there that are always available. There needs to be always a quorum of guys that are up and running that I can so that I can run my operations, and so this means that the quorums have to be um, no greater than n minus f. Okay, this means that even if f guys crash or are Byzantine faulty and become silent and just don't do anything, I can still uh, find a quorum of correct nodes that reply to my operation eventually. Okay. 
So now we have these two equations, this equation and this equation, and by solving these two equations, we obtain uh, n equal 3f plus 1, and uh, uh, this is the total number of replicas, and the quorum size is 2f plus 1. So we have quorums of 2f plus 1 out of 3f plus 1 replicas. Why does this work? Let me give you an example with f equal 2. So if f equal 2, n equal to 3 f plus 1 and 3 f plus 1 in this case is 7 okay and quorums are quorums of 2 f plus 1 so 2 f plus 1 equals 5 and so I can for instance write to this quorum here on the left and uh, I write some value and then I read from some quorum on the right and I have this nice property that any two quorums intersect in at least one non-faulty replica. So this guy here is the guy in the intersection that is going to be aware of the value that was written by this uh, preceding operation here. Okay. So this is the first construction that they give us, uh, these dissemination quorum systems. Um, by, uh, j just to understand why why this number of 2f plus 1 out of 3f plus 1 let's say that we have the same number of replicas n equals 7 and what if these quorums of were smaller what happens if instead of having quorums of five replicas we had quorums of four replicas well it's easy to see what would happen here if we only had quorums of four replicas we wouldn't have the nice intersection property so the right quorum would have to be smaller the read quorum would also be smaller and they would perhaps only intersect in a byzantine replica maybe they would only intersect in this byzantine replica here and so the byzantine replica in the intersection wouldn't suffice to convey the most recently uh, written value because it can't be trusted to convey that value uh, and what happens second question what happens if the quorums were larger well if the quorums were larger uh, we would have the intersection yes this would be fine but we would have another problem we wouldn't have availability of the quorums so if the quorums were quorums of six replicas instead of five then say that these two bad guys the two byzantine replicas if they were silent if they didn't reply to the operations then the operations wouldn't execute because they wouldn't be able to gather a read quorum or a write quorum okay so this shows that you you really need to have two f plus one out of three f plus one it can't be larger than that because you lose um uh, availability it can't be smaller than that because you lose safety because there's no longer intersection okay okay so now now we have this extra tool in our toolbox which are these dissemination quorum systems and let's see what happens if we take yesterday's protocol that Edith Kedar uh, taught you the ABD protocol and uh, replace the crash fault tolerant uh, quorums the majorities with these dissemination quorum systems and, and and by the way, we need to do a couple of other, two other simple uh, adjustments to the protocol. First adjustment, we need to use authenticated channels. So we attach these Macs to the to the point to point messages. This is important, of course, so that I know that I'm talking to the right guy. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, the protocol needs to be driven by the client, not by the proxy replica. You cannot really trust the, the, the proxy replica to, to, to um, to send you um, to be the, the client of the protocol that contacts, gathers a quorum, gathers the replies, and then eventually replies to the client. Because if it's proxy replica, it can be um, Byzantine. And so we, we, we're going to have the client do the job of the proxy replica. Okay. Now, okay, suppose that we make no other changes to ABD other than uh, these three changes. Okay, change the quorums, change the channels, and have the client drive the protocol. Uh, does this work? Is this sufficient? Well, I'm going to convince you that it's not sufficient. Okay, and I hope that this execution doesn't contain any bug. Uh, let's see what happens in this execution. Okay, we have clients now like i said the client is driving the protocol so the client is gathering the quorums and the replies um say that um it wants to write value 12 the client one okay so it gathers first a byzantine a dissemination 
a quorum system so it uh, writes to these three guys and gets uh, the current timestamp say the current timestamp is one um, so this is was it wasn't yet writing I'm sorry it was just querying the current timestamp the current timestamp is one and then it writes the new value value 12 with timestamp equal two and it writes this value to uh, another Byzantine dissemination quorum and gets an acknowledgement okay so the write operation concluded here and we're all happy okay now let's see what happens if subsequently after the write operation ends uh, client 2 does a read now according to uh, either safe or regular or atomic semantics this read I hope that it's going to return 12 because 12 is the most recently written value can I be certain that it's going to return 12 well I'm going to try to convince you that something bad might happen in this case. And what is the bad thing that could happen? Well, first of all, let's assume that Replica 4 didn't receive this um, first uh, write. And it didn't receive it just because this message got lost in the internet or it's just going to take a long, long time to be delivered. Don't forget that we are in the asynchronous model, so messages can take a long time to be delivered. And suppose that Replica 2 is Byzantine faulty. And now, uh, again, we have another ish, uh, instance of uh, asynchronous behavior. So this message here is also going to take a long, long, long time to be delivered to Replica 1. And what's the problem here? The problem is that this read operation is going to gather a Byzantine, a dissemination quorum system of two F plus one replicas, okay, which are these three replicas. And what could happen in this case? Well, it could happen that uh, one of them is going to be stale. Okay, this guy here is going to, so this actually is nice because it shows all possible options that are going to happen in these replies. Replica four is stale, it's just slow, okay? Didn't receive the, the right, and so it's going to return timestamp one, which is fine because that timestamp is going to be uh, ignored, so to speak, because uh, replica three is going to return a higher timestamp. So it's important that uh, replica three says, okay, I have value 12 and it has timestamp two, so it's more recent, it's more fresh than, uh, than, time, than, than, than value seven, okay? This is great. But then we also have a problem. If we don't do any more adaptation to the ABD protocol, we have a problem that replica two, who is Byzantine faulty, is might make up some value, value 99 here. This is a fake value. And it is going to associate it with timestamp five or some high timestamp, something higher than two. Okay. Uh, and if we don't have any other changes to the protocol, this doesn't work because this uh, client, client 2, is just going to accept the highest timestamp, timestamp 5, associated with value 99, and it's just going to propagate value 99 to a quorum, and when that propagation is done, it just returns 99. So this was a violation of uh, atomic semantics or any semantics, <clears throat> atomic safe and regular, because uh, it didn't return the most recently uh, written value. Okay. Uh, so this didn't quite work. Let's try to solve this. Uh, first solution, um, well, the first observation, this is something that they make in the paper, is that uh, you can see this problem as one of, well, we didn't have enough of an intersection. So this is one way to, uh, to address a problem, is just to have a better intersection property than uh, assuming a single uh, correct uh, node in the intersection. And so uh, Malky and Ryder in that paper that I sent you uh, say, uh, observe the following. If you want to have uh, something that works uh, without having to change the protocol that I just presented, you can do the following. You can uh, um, strengthen uh, the, the intersection condition to say that you need a majority of correct or non-faulty replicates in the intersection between any two uh, Byzantine quorums. Okay? And this is what they call uh, masking quorum systems in the um, protocol that I that I. Um, uh, in the paper that I gave you to read. And so uh, we need to redo this math. Okay, so now we have the same intersection size, but uh, uh, which is this two 
q minus n, but now we have a different equation. We need a majority of uh, correct nodes in this intersection. Majority of correct nodes means that, that we need at least 2f plus 1, okay, so that the uh, correct guys outvote the, uh, the, 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 the Byzantine guys in this intersection. And so this gives us a slightly modified equation. And then uh, again, we have the same equation for availability, for making sure that the form is always present. And the solution of these two equations gives us n equal 4f plus 1 and q equal uh, 3f plus 1. These are the masking quorum systems in uh, Malky and Reiter. Okay. So, like I said, uh, uh, so, sorry, this is an example of a masking quorum system. Uh, now, if f equal 2, we have 9 replicas and quorums of 7. What happens with 9 replicas and quorums of 7? Uh, as you can see in this picture, the intersection between two quorums now has a majority of correct nodes. It has three correct nodes which are able to outvote the two incorrect nodes okay and so with um, this um, change now instead of just accepting uh, a value that has the highest timestamp associated with it because keep in mind that this guy can still fake a, a very high timestamp say t equal 5 in the in the in the previous case so instead of accepting a uh, uh, any uh, the, the highest value returned in in a, in, a, in a quorum, we only accept values that are returned by f plus one replicas, so that we are able to accept these values here. These guys are going to return t equal two, t equal two, t equal two, and so this is the value that it will be accepted. So going back to the previous example, like I said. Assuming there's no change to the protocol to the ABD other than the changes that I mentioned, which were authenticated channels, protocol is now driven by the client, and uh, we're using uh, Byzantine quorums instead of majorities. Now uh, it actually works in terms of the previous problematic execution. So what happens in this case? Like I said, this message to replica five is slow. This is slow. And so I have the first write of value 12, which hit this quorum of four replicas. Now we have quorums of three F plus one. In this case, we're using F equal one. And so we are writing to four out of five replicas. So these guys know the most recent value. Now what happens if you have a read operation subsequently after the write finishes and in the case of this read operation this message here is very slow um, and um, I contact a quorum again a quorum of four out of five replicas these four here and the replies are get I get are t equal one t equal two t equal two and t equal five from the bad guy from the Byzantine guy so um, what happens in this case? Well, I'm going to ignore the t equal 5 answer because it doesn't come from f plus 1 replicas. Okay. In, this, in essence, what I'm saying is that these two guys are going to outvote the bad guy. And so uh, I'm going to accept t equal 2 with value 12. And this is the value that is going to be returned and propagated in the second phase of the protocol, which I'm not showing here. Um, but so this is correct in terms of the previous execution. We are fine. We, we solved this. It does introduce a slight complication, which is that the resulting semantics for this protocol isn't quite as strong as the previous semantics. Um, and let's try to see why this was the case. So now we have this execution here. And in this problematic execution, we also have a Byzantine replica. Replica 2 is malicious here. Uh, and now instead of having one slow message, we have two slow messages. So these two messages, both this message and this message are going to take a long, long time to be delivered. Maybe they are going across the internet. And so they're just going to take a long time. Uh, same thing for these two messages, also going to take a long, long time to be delivered. Uh, and let's say that this guy is writing timestamp 2, this guy is writing timestamp 3. And uh, uh, let's think about what is this read operation going to return? What are the timestamps that this guy, this uh, client 3's read is going to uh, see? Well, 
Okay, let's look at these one at a time. So um, this guy is just uh, very slow. It's just clueless. So this is going. This guy is going to return timestamp equal one. Okay. Uh, this guy four. Okay, replica four. What is it going to return? Well, I guess this guy saw timestamp equal three. Okay. What about replica three? Well, replica three. I guess it missed timestamp three, so it's going to return timestamp two. And finally, replica two is Byzantine, so it can return anything. It can return timestamp five or timestamp one hundred, just anything. And so now we have this. Uh, complicated situation that arises uh, in this adaptation of the ABD protocol, <clears throat> which is um, that I, I, there's no way I can return any of these values because I'm just getting four different values from the four replicas in this quorum system. And so the solution there is just to return uh, just some null value or bottom value, okay? And so if you're returning bottom in this case, this means that I get uh, slightly weaker semantics than before. I get safe semantics, okay? These are the semantics that uh, I introduced today. It was, they were different from the, the ones that you saw yesterday with Edith. Um, and they are uh, present in this case, where if a read is concurrent with a write, which is the case here, because these writes haven't finished yet, okay? These write and these write are both still in progress when this, when this read is taking place. Given that the read is concurrent with the write, it can return anything, and in particular, it can return uh, no or bottom, which is going to be uh, the case in this case, okay? All right, so this is nice. Uh, um, uh, we have, um, you know, we, we, we have one adaptation of the ABD protocol, but maybe we want to get rid of these safe semantics. These safe semantics are kind of weird because, you know, the it's like returning smiley face, right? I can just return some arbitrarily value, arbitrary value when there's a concurrent write going on. And so um, there is the possibility of going back to the atomic semantics, the nice atomic semantics of ABD. ABD uh, by using digital signatures. So here's um, here's how it, this can be done. The problem in the previous execution is the following. It was hard to filter out the responses from Byzantine replicas. I mean, ideally, what I would like is to be able to take the highest timestamp and just return that highest timestamp. But I cannot do that because I cannot trust the uh, single reply from the Byzantine replica. So what if I were, what if I was able to filter out somehow the replies coming from the Byzantine replicas. Well, it turns out that I can do it by making it impossible to invent a, a, a reply uh, thanks to uh, self-verifying information, as they call it in uh, Malky and Reiter's paper. And this is essentially uh, using digital signatures. The idea of digital signatures um, like I said, uh, in digital signatures, everyone has a public-private key pair. Everyone knows all processes, uh, public keys. And the idea, and this includes the, the clients, by the way, uh, not only for the replicas, uh, and the idea is the following. When um, the client wants to write a new value, so this is in the second phase of the write protocol. Before writing, before the second phase of the write protocol, they sign uh, with their public key, they sign a the value timestamp pair that is going to be written to all the replicas. And then when the read gathers a Byzantine quorum, uh, it can just discard the values that are made up by the bad replicas. Why? Because they are not correctly signed. Their signature doesn't validate. And so this um, this uh, this is nice because this allows us to then um, 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 just take the highest timestamp with a valid reply and trust that to be the most recent answer, uh, the most recent value that was written. Okay, and and the cool thing about this is that not all, not only we regain the atomic semantics, we are no longer. Um, we, we have stronger semantics in this case, but also we it allows us to go back to dissemination quorum systems, the more efficient quorum systems and more widely used in most protocols uh, of Byzantine fault tolerance, which are the three F plus one replicas and quorums of uh, two F plus one. Okay. So let's uh, again uh, 
go uh, back to our adaptation of the ABD protocol to the Byzantine setting. Uh, and this adaptation requires a new step, which is the, the, the thing that is written here in red, which is when I write, the writes now have a new parameter, which is the signature from the client of the pair timestamp value that was written. Um, and so, uh, again, uh, this execution is very similar to the previous one that was problematic. Uh, and now we have client one writing value 12 with timestamp two. Again, two of these messages take a long time to be delivered. Now, same thing with client two um, writing value 26 with timestamp three. Two of its messages are going to take a long time to be delivered. What's going to happen when client three attempts to read? Um, well, first of all, if it reads from replica one and replica one tries to forge timestamp five with value 99, this is going to be discarded. This message is going to be ignored. It's not even going to count towards the towards the the, the, the protocol because it, there's just no way it can associate a valid signature with this uh, value 99 and timestamp five. The only thing that Replica One could do if it wanted to try to um, uh, to to subvert the protocol would be to provide a stale value. Maybe it could provide it could ignore this um, this uh, right over here and instead provide value uh, 12 with timestamp two. But um, that's basically the worst thing that it can do. It can no longer forge uh, bad values with a high timestamp. And this allows us to do the following. Say that I gather a quorum consisting uh, uh, of replica two. Replica two is going to return uh, uh, timestamp two with value 12 because this message took a uh, because this message here never reached uh, uh, replica 2 because it just took a long time to be delivered uh, let's uh, what reply does it get from replica 3 well replica 3 actually has timestamp 3 because it received uh, timestamp 3 over here and replica 4 is just clueless it's just very slow so it's going to return timestamp 1 but still out of these three messages that are all different but I they are uh, self-verifying, meaning that they are digitally signed. And so the client three knows uh, these are three valid messages. I can just take the highest timestamp and take it as the value that is going to be returned. And so there is this uh, second phase that you guys um, know about uh, propagating the highest value. This is important to ensure atomicity. And um, in this second phase, I uh, have timestamp equal, uh, I'm propagating the highest timestamp, timestamp equal three. And uh, the signature that I received here associated with timestamp three, this signature here is going to be propagated to all the replicas. And I get a, a quorum of acknowledgements and I return value 26. Okay, I return the value of this second right here. Okay, so this is great. Okay, so now we have ABD uh, with, uh, Byzantine quorums and it provides atomic semantics and the changes we made just to recap, we uh, inserted authenticated channels with point-to-point -point authentication using Max. We um, uh, changed the quorums to be a uh, three F plus one out of four F plus one replicas. We, um, what else did we do? Uh, we added this step of digital signatures. So when a write takes place, the client uh, signs that write and this write is then validated here. And uh, thanks to these uh, very simple changes, we now have a Byzantine fault tolerant version of ABD with atomic semantics, okay? Rodrigo? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. Uh, just to just to clarify a little bit. So you were, you you mentioned uh, three F plus one quorums of out to out to, uh, out of four F plus one replicas, and that mm -hmm. was the uh, the the sort of the counter example to motivate the necessity of uh, using uh, signatures. So even if you make are, uh, larger quorums, still you cannot uh, fix the problem with Byzantine replicas. Right. Right. And it's then uh, when you introduce signatures, 
sort of okay sort of right the, the reason the reason why i say sort of right is the following um, you, you can still obtain a reasonable semantics in this case it's just that it's not atomic uh, in a sense what happens when you do that when you have so this is the problematic execution it has four f plus one replicas uh and quorums of three f plus one uh, you, you can still obtain safe semantics this this is the example i gave with uh, a read returning uh, value 12 because value 12 had concluded this write had concluded before and so uh, because this write had concluded it had propagated its value to uh, those three f plus one and when i contact this quorum i get f plus one replies and these f plus one replies are sufficient to return 12. so this is good but this is not atomic. This is these uh, weaker uh, safe semantics. And the counter example that I gave to explain that these are uh, only safe semantics and not atomic is uh, this case where the writes are still in progress and I get all different replies. I get, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and so I, because I get all different replies, I have to return uh, no. And so this is the problem, yeah. Yeah, but uh, even if you only uh, try to get safe semantics, I still don't see how you can do this if you if uh, if a bad replica can impersonate a client, sort of, and can claim no, that uh, okay. something from the client. But the question is, um, uh, maybe you, you're getting at, at an important point here, which is that uh, we are assuming that the clients are not Byzantine faulty. Okay. So clients are correct, uh, and then clients being when the clients are busy in faulty, it's it's a whole different story. And uh, in in fact, I had a paper with Barbara in in 2006 where we discussed what happens when when the clients are busy in faulty. But so assuming that the clients are correct, then the replica cannot do what you said. It cannot pretend that it received uh, uh, something from the client because it could not forge the signature that the clients send. In this step. Oh, okay, so we, we still do assume that the signatures are are, are used, but on the client side. Yeah. Yes, I on see. the client side. Yeah. yeah. So that's the that's the, the the trick for being able to use um, uh, these three uh, f plus one and two f plus one um, you know, normal Byzantine quorums. Uh, we need to add these client signatures uh, to to ABD. Okay. Okay, and there was there was a short discussion in the chat, but it looks yes. like it's it's about the use of uh, the use of uh, signatures. But it looks like it's uh, it's been yeah. I think I think that Ahmed, by now. Ahmed, yeah, Ahmed uh, just is fine because each client has its private key, and the assumption really is that the clients are well behaved. They're not going to leak their private key. Um, if the clients were Byzantine, then. Um, uh, it, it's a fairly complicated story. <laughs> so I yeah, can point you to the, the, the classical protocols, uh, the well, like PDFT, they, they tolerate these anti clients easily. Well, easily. Yeah, yeah. By, by assuming uh, certificates. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, so the, the 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 overall conclusion could be that to say that uh, you can use uh, larger quorums, and without forcing the replicas to sign uh, the messages, uh, you can achieve safe semantics. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank this, you. This would be this would be a, a more efficient protocol because it doesn't have to require it doesn't require using uh, digital signatures, which are much more expensive. Uh, but it has the downside of um, of, of uh, having not only more replicas but also weaker semantics, which are these uh, safe semantics. Um, and there is an the... interesting question. Can we make any crash fault? Uh, can we? Ah, that's a good question. So, can we transform any crash fault tolerant protocol into Byzantine fault tolerant protocol using this uh, strategy? Um, um, I, I, I don't think it doesn't generalize that easily uh, because um, um, th this only generalizes for protocols that are uh, driven by the clients. So the characteristic of ABD uh, that is important here is that there's no um, replica to replica communication in, 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 in ABD. Um, 
and and uh, this is what allows us to use this strategy because the clients are always driving you know these RPCs to all the replicas. Uh, then um, then we can apply this strategy of having the clients sign the protocols. If uh, if we had replica to replica communication, then the general generalization wouldn't uh, wouldn't be applicable. Okay. And in fact. I'm trying to think, as I was giving this explanation, I was trying to think whether I could point to a paper that uh, spoke about uh, generic uh, ways to, uh, generic strategies for generalizing protocols from one model to the next. I, I need to dig that up. So, but if you send me an email, maybe I, I can, I can, I can point you to a paper or, uh, that, that discusses that. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure if I missed any other question. No, I think so. We are fine. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So we still have 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to, I have a, a few more slides that discuss um, the, um, um, we have a few more slides that discuss um, Byzantine fault tolerant uh, protocols. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, in, in the spirit of Edith's talk from yesterday, I was going to also move from the read-write model to m more sophisticated problems, uh, uh, more, more, more complex uh, specifications. But instead of going to consensus, which is quite uh, a little bit too complex, I'm just going to look at uh, the broadcast problem. It's like a, um, some, a problem that is somewhere in between consensus and uh, and uh, and uh, and read write in terms of how hard it is to solve. Uh, and and actually, the slides that I'm going to use here are, were borrowed from. Uh, Piotr's uh, advisor, uh, Rashid Gerawi, uh, he, uh, he um, I, I gave a, a course at IST, which was based on the book that he wrote with uh, Luis Rodriguez and Christian Cachan. And, uh, and so he nicely uh, uh, allowed me to use uh, these slides. Uh, and so um, just just to motivate <clears throat> that uh, there are other, um, how to make other types of protocols uh, Byzantine fault tolerant, um, I'm going to use the um, consistent broadcast problem, okay? So it's not as complicated as consensus, but it's uh, it's more perhaps more interesting than read write. So in this uh, consistent broadcast problem, uh, we have these four uh, correctness conditions. Um, we have a process P that wants to broadcast a message M. Okay, one of the processes in the group of replicas wants to uh, broadcast a message to everyone. And uh, if that process is correct, then I need to make sure, meaning that it's non non Byzantine faulty, I need to make sure that all the correct processes um, will deliver that message. Okay. Um, we have to make sure. Um, um, uh, you, uh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, Eugene has some some interesting questions, but that's that's better for the discussion room. Um, okay, we have to make sure that uh, correct processes only deliver one one message, and uh, um, we can we have to make sure that the messages are not forged. So basically, if I have a, a correct sender that uh, is supposed to have um, sent a message M, then this guy actually sent the message M. Um, and this is, and, and, and then property four, this is the more interesting one. Um, uh, if I have a, a, a correct process that delivers some message M and another one, a different correct process that also delivers some message M prime, then they must be the same. I cannot have two correct processes, two non-Byzantine processes that are um, uh, delivering different messages, okay? And so how do we achieve this? Well, we achieve this uh, again, um using uh, uh there are two variants of, of of protocols that can be used one of them uses max and so it's cheaper in terms of the uh, crypto but more expensive in terms of the number of messages that are exchanged and the other uses signatures uh so it ha has expensive uh crypto but only a linear number of messages okay let's Look at these protocols again. They use um, these nice uh, dissemination quorum systems. Okay, uh, three F plus one replicas and quorums of two F plus one. And in the first protocol, the one that uses max, uh, the idea is that the the it has two rounds. In the first round, there the sender, the guy who's broadcasting, is going to send the messages, the message it wants to broadcast to all the messages, and then we have this. Uh, 
all-to-all -all communication in the second round, which is an echo. So this all-to-all -all communication is a pattern that is going to uh, later appear in um, uh, consensus protocols like like uh, well, like uh, hot stuff, but also like uh, PBFT and others. Um, and and this uh, this all-to-all -all communication is basically an echo. I'm going to be echoing uh, the message that was disseminated, and this echo is important because if a bad guy is trying to disseminate different messages M prime and M in the first round, then uh, the echoes are going to ensure that um, only one of these two is going to prevail. So I cannot violate this condition of having a good, correct process uh, delivering uh, different uh, messages. Okay. So, uh, uh, in, in these slides, these slides actually follow uh, the book's presentation quite closely. So they start with the uh, with uh, the, the the pseudocode of of the of the protocol, and in this pseudocode we have uh, flags that indicate whether I have already delivered a message in this broadcast protocol, or and whether I have already sent the echo message. Um, and the idea is the following. If I want to uh, broadcast a message M, what I do is I send to everyone uh, this uh, send message with M. Okay? And this doesn't have a signature. It only has point-to-point -point authentication. Um, if I receive a send message and I haven't echoed yet, then I echo. So I set the echo flag to true and I send echo M to everyone. And then the important thing is I collect all the echoes in this variable here and I so as soon as I have at least two f plus one echoes for the same message m and I haven't delivered yet then I set deliver to true and I finish the protocol by saying uh, that I'm going to deliver message m so I think this is easier to understand through a uh, timing diagram so I have uh, these uh, three F plus one rep processes, okay, or replicas, that they want to uh, broadcast a message M. And uh, the idea is that uh, process P is going to, in the first phase, send the message to everyone, sends the message to this, to this, to this process. And each guy, when they receive this first phase message, they're going to echo to everyone okay, the, uh, the message that they received. And once I receive two F plus one echoes, so I have one, two, three echoes. This guy also has one, two, three echoes. Then they can deliver message M. Um, why is this echo message important? Let's say that P was malicious and P was trying to trick the good processes into uh, uh, accepting different messages M and M prime. Well, it would be hard. It could trick them in the first phase, in the send phase, but not in the echo phase. So basically, uh, in the first phase, maybe P can send M prime to process R and send M to process uh, Q and maybe also to process S. But then the problem is that in the echo phase, uh, process Q here, for instance, uh, would either collect a uh, um, uh, message M from uh, two F plus one guys or message M prime, but it couldn't really collect both. So it's really impossible for uh, these two guys to be delivering uh, wrong uh, messages. Okay. So um, um, then again, following the, the book very closely, this, this has a proof of correctness of the protocol. 
<laughs> namely the proof that uh, the protocol is uh, a, a has validity. Validity is, is is quite simple because it says that if a process, if a correct process, a non-faulty process broadcasts a message M, then every uh, non-faulty process is going to deliver M. But this just follows from um, going through the protocol steps. If the process is correct, it's going to um, make sure that every correct process sends echoes to everyone else. Um, then uh, all the correct processes are eventually, uh, after some time, going to deliver uh, at least n minus f echoes from all the correct guys, and uh, n minus f is two uh, f plus one, and so um, this means that every correct process is going to deliver the message containing the echo messages. Uh, there's no duplication. This is really by algorithm design. Uh, because the processes have this flag uh, delivered and they don't deliver uh, uh, once delivered is set to true. So this means that uh, they only deliver a single message. So this is really correct by design. Um, the uh, 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 integrity, this means that uh, if processes are correct, they're not going to make up uh, messages because they're always sent through these authenticated links. And so uh, this means that um, you cannot make up a value. The, the interesting property, like I said, is really this consistency property. If some uh, correct process uh, delivers a message M and another correct process delivers a message M prime, then the two messages are uh, really the same. And this comes from the uh, uh, the echo phase, okay? So how do you prove the correctness of this? Uh, basically, you prove this by contradiction. Let's assume uh, that uh, uh, a correct process uh, 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 delivered a message M, and there was a different correct process, okay, that delivered message M prime, okay? Let's assume that they were different, okay? Well, then we roll back uh, the, the protocol and, and see what happened. Uh, if correct process P delivered M, well, it must have received echo messages from a quorum of two F plus one guys, okay? Two F plus one here. Um, now, the same reasoning applies to this other process. The guy who delivered M prime also received a uh, echo messages from two F plus one guys. But if you think of the two Byzantine quorums, they need to intersect in one guy. So these two quorums, the, one, the ones that sent echo messages for M and for M prime, they overlap in at least one correct process. But by construction of the algorithm, this one correct process couldn't have sent echo messages for both M and M prime. If we go back to the protocol design, you don't send echo messages once you already send an echo message. And so there is no way that a correct process could have sent an echo message for both M and M prime. So we found a contradiction here. Okay. So um, this is the correctness process, uh, correctness proof for for the uh, consistency property, um, which is the the difficult property here. So we are actually just on time. Uh, my suggestion is that we stop here. I still have a just a couple of slides on this part um, that I will finish on the beginning of uh, the second part of the lecture, and then I will. Um, provide you with the research material uh, after that. Does that sound good? Can we take a break now?